welcome everybody. Um, my name is Mike Murray. My co-presenter here is Lee Kushner. Thank you for coming to the presentation. Uh, absolutely. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about security careers today. And I thought we'd start by talking about where this all got started. Um, this whole conversation, I think, between Lee and I and, and even you know, before that, got started a few years ago at Black Hat when a good friend of ours whose name is Scott Blake asked the following question. What's the difference between a hacker and a security professional? And what answer does Scott come up with? The answer is a mortgage. <laughs> so from there, I, that was one of the first conversations Lee and I ever had. He, he was telling me this joke. And we actually met a few years ago at Black Hat as well. And the story has a lot to do with what we're talking about. Because for once, we both stayed at the Mirage. Um, and that's pretty weird. You know, we had both booked late. Neither of us was at Caesars for Black Hat. And we got in the elevator at the Mirage one day. And, you know, we didn't know each other. We had never met before. I knew who he was. I mean, he's Lee Kushner. He's like the security recruiter, right? I mean, I put our bios up on the, on the screen. But I think most of you probably know who he is. And at the time, I was running vulnerability research for a little company up, or an office up in Canada for N-Circle. And uh, we got talking. I mean, anybody who's ever walked from the Mirage to uh, Black Hat at Caesars know we, knows we had some time to chat. Um, and we got talking about where I wanted to go in my career and where he had seen people go from, you know, from vulnerability research and how you, how you get out of being just a vulnerability researcher to be something more, you know, to be regardless of where you want to go, whether you want to be a CTO of a company or a CISO at a, you know, at a bank or whatever. The whole question was, okay, how do you go from you know, from wherever you are to wherever you want to be. And I think that conversation started about three years ago, and I think we talk at least once a month about that same thing to this day. And we got talking and decided, well, what the hell, let's, let's do something for DEF CON. You know, let's, let's come here, and there's probably a lot of people who are either just starting out or regardless of where you are in your career, trying to go somewhere. Um, and I've been there, and I've been the one in the seats kind of you know, wondering, wondering how to get where I want to go. So hopefully we can, we can talk a little bit about all of those things. You know, it's, it's very interesting when you come to a conference, you know, like this or any of the other events that you might attend in the information security industry. And the one thing that everybody has in common is that everybody has a career. Everybody is proud of what they do. Everybody has aspirations to do things past what they're doing. And with any young industry like the information security industry is, I mean, really, I mean, it's really only been significantly on the corporate map for 10 years or so. Because the industry is so immature, there isn't any really well-defined roadmap on how to get from point A to point Z. So going through talking with your friends, understanding what you want out of your career is quite important. And um, we're going to talk about a lot of those discussions here. We're going to talk about probably a lot of things that you think about on your own, things that may be discussed with your friends, talking about things like what's important to you. Are you want a job and a paycheck? I once had a, uh, when I was first starting out, and um, my, my, one of my first jobs was um, selling vacuums. I answered some ad, and uh, you'd now make $100,000 in a year, and it was all great. And the first thing they did was show us this, I guess, You'd call it a PowerPoint now, but uh, they had job, and they said, job stands for just over broke. You don't want a job. You want to own your own business. You want to sell vacuums. So um, <laughs> I, 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 that was my shortest duration of any of my jobs, <laughs> T minus two hours. But, um, but, you know, you want to talk about things about, you know, what is your career path? Because your career path is different than anybody else's in this room. It's unique to you. Things that are important to you are things that are important, you know, back to other folks. Um, Go back to the other slide. Yeah. Um, just in things like taking ownership of your own career. How do you go about doing that? Building your own brand. Helping define who you are. What makes people think, what, what others think about when they hear your name or when they think about your work and your work product. You know, 
what really is the best job that you have or, or how you can make the most out of your own job, the one that you do have. How could you make your job better? Um, understanding why is a good reason to change jobs, really understanding what might be a bad reason to change jobs, and really trying to figure out, you know, how to get where I need to go. So. So we've been up here for about four minutes, and I think between the two of us, we've probably said the words career path about ten times. And you guys have probably all hear, heard those words a million times. But I think we need to, we need to define what that is. Um, I know a lot of people in security, and, and I'm sure there's a couple people out there in the audience that just jump from job to job, you know? Oh, this sounds cool today. This sounds cool tomorrow. And that's, that's kind of a neat way to live. You know, it's fun, but you... I mean, we've both seen a lot of people who look up 10 years later and go, well, my skills are obsolete, now what the heck do I do? All those things, all your decisions, and I think the one thing that, you know, it would be a recurring theme today is that whatever decision you make regarding your career, you will ultimately reap the rewards from and you will ultimately pay the consequences of. So when you're making any of these decisions, you have to really think about getting the information, getting the right information, and figuring out how that affects you personally. And security is particularly interesting for that because as Lee mentioned, it's a young field. You know, if you think about if you think about a lot of the careers that maybe our parents had or, you know, people that we know that aren't in tech had, the career path is very different. And we need to to be clear about what's different in those career paths than is different in ours. Um, in most careers you get this well defined steps. You know, if you look at, you know, let's let's use accounting as an example. We all like to pick on accountants, yeah. don't we? You got to pick on accountants. So, I mean, think about the career path through accounting. You go through school, you get a degree in finance, and then you start working your way up. And it's pretty well defined. You start out as a junior financial person, and you pretty much move up through senior person, controller, CFO. Some people jump off to do their own accounting firms and that sort of thing, but for the most part, the steps are pretty well defined. There's a degree in it. Everybody knows that you have to get your um, your CFA. I, I think is uh, CFA is Canadian. I can't C remember what the uh, well your CPAs, your CFPs, your CFPs exactly. or some sort of C. Where, where <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, and in, actually, in that field, the C actually means something. <laughs> well, the other thing is this: if you ask the hundred CFOs, how did you become a CFO? you would probably find a hundred very similar career paths. And, and they'd all look like that, actually. Somewhat. Yeah, pretty much. And, and security's different. I mean, security's really more like a real mountain, where there's a whole lot of different ways up the mountain. I mean, I could probably, you know what, I might actually do a little bit of the survey here. I mean, we can look at the security career as, as a whole bunch of different, different pieces on the bottom. I mean, there's not... Let me actually ask the question, is there anyone in this room who went through school and has, has a degree in security? Give a hand, give a round yeah, of applause. Yeah, exactly, because I know if I had asked that question five years ago, there wouldn't have been a hand in the house. That's actually really cool. But it still wasn't very many hands. If we walked into an accountant's conference and asked who has a degree in finance, the number of people who didn't put up their hand would be less than the number of people who just did. So really, security has a particularly interesting career path because everyone starts out in a different place and everyone has a different way to get there. Um, one of the things that we have been very lucky to notice is that there's really a difference between the technical track and the management track. And at some point, you have to make the decision. You know, one of the best things, you know, to talk to Mike is that one of the best things about this industry, and I think one of the things that drew me to it 11 years ago, was the fact that People come into this industry from very diverse backgrounds. There are not cookie cutter personalities in this industry. There are not cookie cutter um, education paths. Um, the respect is earned in this industry. It's not just given because of some school you went to, some letters after your name. It's kind of about what you've accomplished and what you've done. And, you know, that own, um, I don't know, you would call it. Um, just uh, whether it's the secret handshakes or this the understand respect of one people share for each other as professionals by coming to conferences like this I mean that's unique people come to this profession you know uh, some of the best folks you know they started out when they were eight nine ten years old and you know I'm sure most of some of you are in this room and you just became interested in things 
and you just became interested in wanting to learn and you become passionate about it and your avocation became your vocation because someone's now writing the checks. And that's a really great thing about this industry. And what Mike said that, you know, five years ago, people wouldn't have had a function, a degree in information security. It just didn't really exist. Here and there, a couple of programs. But the fact that it's coming so quick and it's accelerating so much, I think that's just a testament that, you know, finally we have a place where, where people who have interested in, in doing the type of work that you all do, I, it's great because opportunities are being created. And when there are more opportunities, there are more challenges because there are more choices. And I think that's kind of what it cuts back to. Absolutely. And, and so fundamentally, I, I mean, we've been, we're pretty excited about this. Anybody who talks to either of us for more than five minutes has probably heard us talk about some facet of this. But really, why should you guys care? And, and that's, that's really the big question. And my answer is that the rules have changed. You know, when our parents went to work, the, the game was different. Um, my mom worked for a large bank in Canada for 34 years. Same job. You know, she moved up. And her boss always took responsibility for making sure she had the right training. And they defined her career path. And every year they reviewed her and said, hey, you're doing a great job on your career path. Keep that up. And very few people changed careers. You know, very pe few people went out and changed jobs. But the world is different and especially in our industry the world is different this is not an industry I mean so I actually spent six years at one company in this industry um, and by the day that I left I was the only person that remembered the day that I started when I tell my parents or my grandparents how often I'm switching jobs they look at me like I've lost my mind and I'm sure that there's more, I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads out in the audience, so I've got a pretty good idea that you guys have all experienced that. And what we're really here to say, and I, I hate to be the ones to tell you all this, but it's all up to you. You know, in our parents' generation, the company took care of you. The company made sure you had a pension when you retired. The company made sure that you were growing. The company made sure that you were doing the things that needed to be done. Not no more. It's all up to you. And... So you really need to take the responsibility for your own career because nobody's going to make it happen for you, Ex except you, really. Ultimately, you're the one that will, like I said before, that you'll reap the rewards or you'll pay the consequences. So every decision that you make has a cause and effect to it. And, um, you know, Mike was talking about, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a personal, it's a personal issue here. You really have to know yourself. You really have to know what's important to you. You have to know what makes you tick. And you have to know what, you know, what gets you excited and where you actually might want to get to. So fundamentally, who are you? And, and you know, the, the quote from the previous slide is an important one and was said a few thousand years ago by a guy who kind of knew his way around. And it's the fundamental question when you're asking yourself about your career. What are you good at? You know, what, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What gets you excited? And what are you not so good at? I'll tell you about myself. If you put me in a job where all I did was watch logs all day, I would go absolutely insane. I would just go nuts. If you put me in a job where I just had to um, manage, you know, that everything just kept going the way it was going yesterday, I'd go nuts. But if you put me in a job where there's nothing going on, you know, my, my job in Canada... They, the only thing that was in Canada when I got there was a cafe. We didn't have real estate. We didn't have an office. We didn't have a team. We didn't have anything. I flew up there. We started interviewing. There are a couple people here who actually interviewed in that cafe before we had an office. Um, and that's the kind of challenge that gets me excited. I bet some people in this room would be absolutely terrified by that. Um, the point is, you have to know what you're good at. You have to know what you like. And that, only then can you really make the decisions about where you want to go. I always uh, think of it as, a, um, as the vegetable theory. You know, when you're a child and um, your mom or dad prepares you some vegetables, you figure out which ones you like and which ones you don't like. And if you keep liking broccoli, well, then mom continues to cook broccoli. If you keep liking, if you hate cucumbers, you don't get cucumbers anymore. So the truth is this, is that you're trying to figure out what it is that you're good at and you're being able to either dismiss it or be able to embrace it. And I think that those things are just very important. And when you think about yourself, 
thinking about kind of well, what it might be your strengths, what might be your weaknesses, where you might want to develop your own careers and your own skills to either make yourself a more rounded, well-rounded person and be able to find yourselves positions that enable you to do things that actually take your skills, utilize them to the fullest, develop your weaknesses so they don't exist anymore, and those types of things. So, so all the research shows that you are going to be happiest when you're doing the things that you're the, you're the best at. If you read most of the research out there, it will tell you that when you are working on the things that you're already competent at and you're expanding those strengths, you're happiest and most challenged. And we'll talk about strengths and weaknesses in a second, but I want to talk about skills for a second because when, when we have a tendency to talk about skills, the first thing that comes up is what programming languages do you know and you know, have you used IDA before and can you, can you reverse engineer protocols and you know, how, how comfortable are you with TCP dump on the command line? And that is a really important part of skills, but it's not the whole deal. There's a whole lot of skills that when, when, you're, when you're a hiring manager, and I've hired enough people to, to speak to this pretty, pretty authoritatively, you're looking for more than just the technical skills. I mean, there's a lot of people in the world who can code. There's not necessarily a lot of people who can work together to solve a problem, you know, or who can solve a problem they've never seen before, or who know how to research and find the answer to something that, that they didn't you know, see in a book somewhere. And so I, I actually I ripped off this model from something that was in the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago. And I've, I've sort of expanded it over that course of time to the point that it doesn't really look like what was in HBR anymore. But it was called the Portfolio Model of Human Capital. And really the idea is, how do we talk about all the skills that people have? Because technical skills are only one of those. And technical skill here, there's a reason I put quotes around technical. Because if you're a manager, the technical skills of being a manager aren't necessarily what we would consider IT skills. There are things like budgeting and you know, PowerPoints and doing Excel spreadsheets and making sure that you can make a strong cost justification for things. Those are the technical skills of managers. Um, but there are, there are a whole lot of other skills that we don't talk about as often. Strategic skill, where you're talking about can someone think on a broad scale? You know, everyone pretty much can get a task list done. Can someone prioritize and figure out how to have strat you know how to make decisions with strategy? How well do they know the industry? I mean, when you walk into DEF CON, or actually more accurately, when you walk into RSA, how many of the companies do you know and how many how 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 quickly can you ferret out the snake oil? How do you know how the puzzles the puzzle pieces fit together? Exactly. And how does that relate to your job, not just what your job is, but what your company is doing as a whole? I mean, um, one of the uh, well, it's one of the questions you're talking about skills. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many people here think they have good communication skills? How many people think that all the people they've talked to recently have good communication skills? I think there's a mismatch there. Communication is a skill. Everybody thinks in, in the recruiting business. People always say to us, they say, "Well, I'm a people person." That's great. We're all people persons, you know, I mean, we're people people. But I mean, when you think about it, though, communication is a skill. It's a skill that has to be developed just like technology. It has to be developed just like anything that you do, and it's a skill that you have to work on. So there are different degrees of people's communication skills. Um, how many people think they're good negotiators? Of course. Everyone's a good negotiator. Everybody goes to go buy a car. Of course, we're going to negotiate those prices well. The truth of the matter is, is that that's a skill as well. So all, a lot of skills that we think about are just actually kind of coming towards us are things that we just assume that we're good at. The assumption that we're good at it almost discredits the skill itself. So when you're thinking about all these different skills that create a skill matrix or will enable you to be successful in your career, you have to then be able to put your own value and your own score to those skills, take a baseline of where you are, and then figure out and be honest with yourself about what do I need to do to improve? How can I go about improving? And is it even worth improving? Absolutely. So there's actually something I wanted to sort of backtrack and talk a little bit about on here. Um, is, it's, that, it's that line that says weirdness quotient. And I think it's a really important thing that we all overlook. Because, 
you know, there are places where you will fit in and there are, there are places where you won't. If you like to wear a suit to work every day, there's a lot of tech startups where that's going to be kind of strange. Um, if you hate to wear a suit every day, I wouldn't suggest wearing, working on Wall Street. And that's an important piece to know. What is your work, what is your, your sort of style and how does that fit into whatever company you're looking for? You know, are they going to think you're absolutely freaky and out there? Because you have to be able to form relationships with these people. And so, jumping away from that for a sec, we talked a little bit about strengths and weaknesses. Um, we, we came to the realization in, in talking about this, everybody only talks about strengths and weaknesses, but there's actually three categories. Because all your strengths usually matter. But we spend a lot of time, and I'm sure everyone has been in that performance review, or at least a lot of you have been in that performance review, where someone tells you that you're weak in something that you know has absolutely no bearing on your job. And that if you don't improve that, that you get your job done just fine every single day of your life. So there's actually two types of weaknesses. There's the ones that actually keep you from advancing in your career and actually impact you. And there's the ones that don't. And you really have to figure out which ones, the different, which ones make the difference. Because unfortunately, back to the whole theme of this, nobody's going to tell you. It's up to you to figure that out. Um, and, and learning which of those are which is going to allow you to spend a whole lot less time wasted on fixing weaknesses that don't matter. You know, again, I'll, I'll use a personal example. Um, I, I have a tendency to get bored really easily. Um, luckily, I'm in information security. That doesn't much matter because I work in an industry that's fast enough and on, in, in jobs that give me the opportunity to work in 12 different ways on any given day. You know, I can be working on PowerPoints in the morning and Excel in the afternoon and code in, you know, later in the evening. I don't have to worry about getting bored. In another industry, that would be a difference that mattered. If I was an accountant, for example, that probably would, would not be such a good trait. So you need to figure out which are which and move on, you know, move on that. So you know all about yourself. You know, assuming... Assuming we've gotten through to you, you've sat down and you've thought about who you are and what your strengths are and, um, and what your weaknesses are and you're working on yourself. But the question is who else does because your career is impacted by other people as well. And when you, you, know, when you have your career and you know, you're talking about who you are, I mean, I think one of the things that you talk about, and Mike says, he uses the term personal branding. and. Um, you know, we're all, when you're in your career, you're all responsible for marketing yourself. You're all responsible for marketing yourself on a daily basis. You're responsible for enabling the people who you work with, the people who are your industry peers, the people whom you report to, to really understand who you are. So they have a good understanding of what you're capable of and what you'd like to tackle. And by doing that on a daily basis, by doing that continually over the course of the time, you're able to develop a personal brand, both within your organization, both within the industry, at lower levels of your organization, and at higher levels of your team. And I, I, I really, I hesitate to use the word personal brand. It's, it's the hot career topic of the moment if you read the career blogs and the career books. But I really think of it really as just you know, what do people think of when they hear your name? You know, and I've got some examples up there. I, I mean, if you have some thoughts, shout it out. What do you think of when you hear Schneier's name? Airport security. Airport security. That's, yeah, exactly. Um, secrets and lies. I mean, we all have this pretty much the same picture of Schneier in our head, don't we? I mean, I bet if I asked... If I asked all of you, you know, about Bruce, we could all give a pretty, pretty similar picture. Um, ditto any of the names that are up there. Um, and so that's what your brand really is. Your brand is what do people think of when they hear your name? It, and if you can find a common denominator there, that's, that's what represents you in the world. Now, of course, I'm talking about this and I'm using all these names that everybody's heard of, right? I'm using all these famous names, and you're probably sitting there going, yeah, but I don't have books, and I don't have all of this stuff. But it's not just about that, because you do have a personal brand. Branding happens on smaller scales. And I think it's really important to realize that you have a brand whether you like it or not. 
I mean, anybody can think about their friends and think of the guy who's always late or the girl who's always late. Everyone, can, everyone has that person in their life, I'm sure. And realize that's their brand to you. That's their brand in your circle of friends. You have a brand at your company, whether you like it or not. Whether it's you're the person that everybody goes to when, when everything falls apart, or whether it's you're the person that's always late to meetings. You have a brand. And these are the things that are going to cause you to succeed or, or you know, not so much succeed in your career. So ask yourself, what's your brand? You know, what do you want to be known for? What do you want to represent when people hear your name? And the hard thing is, it's not always easy to change your brand. I mean, if your friend who's always late started showing up on time, you're not going to just magically start thinking of them as the friend that's always on time. It takes time with that. Where it doesn't take time is with new people. And the opportunity to meet new people is an opportunity to teach people about a different, a different brand. We have some people in the audience. I mean, I, I see some nodding about, you know, there's definitely some people here who are, who are good branders. But um, it's really an important thing to realize that your brand will be the limit of what you can do. Now, I have a question. I just did three slides on branding and talked about it for like three and a half minutes. There's a common theme in all of it. What was it? <laughs> it's your fault. I, actually, that was a common theme, but there's actually there's another common theme, and it was all about relationship. Your brand doesn't exist in you; it exists in other people. It, when I notice, I wasn't asking Bruce what he thought his brand was. I was asking you what he thought, what you thought Bruce's brand was. Your brand doesn't exist because you think you're the smartest. It's because everybody thinks that you're the smartest, and so it's all about being known. Your brand is ultimately a function of who knows you and who you know. Because the people around you ultimately determine who you end up being. I, I love this statistic. It's a fascinating statistic that if you, if you do the research, your income will be, on a, almost always, your income will be within 10% of your five closest friends. Almost always. That speaks to the power of how important the people around you are. Not only do they hold your brand in their hands, but they hold your image of yourself in your hands and you live up to who they are. And ultimately, the, the more friends you have and the better friends you have, the better brand you have and the better network you have and the farther along that you go. So what's the best job for you? Yeah. I mean, the best job for you is basically the job that you have. And that might sound really crazy coming from a guy who makes his living about helping people move jobs. But the truth of the matter is the best advice that we give, and Mike and I knew each other for about 18 months before we ever even talked about any potential opportunities for him because the jobs didn't line up with what he was doing, with what he wanted to do. And the truth of the matter is, is that in your job that you currently have, it's really up to you to try to figure out ways how to make your job better. Because, you know, the grass is always greener. I mean, you know, when you talk to, um, you think about what people might be doing in other businesses or in other careers or in other environments, say, so, wow, they have it really good there. You know, their, their bosses, uh, you know, they have a bigger training budget or, you know, they have half-day Fridays or um, oh, they're getting paid 10% more than what I'm earning. But you don't really know what it's like to go up and work in that environment on a daily basis. So the truth of the matter is, is that everybody creates an illusion that, you know, their job's really not as good as what could be out there. And I think that, you know, you always think about, you know, what might be. And I think that's a big trend because you hear stories about someone who just got a huge pay raise. Or you hear somebody who's um, just doing something uniquely different. And say, I want that job too. A lot of times you could have that job in your own company if you know how to actually work the internal channels, you know how to develop your brand internally, and be able to look at opportunity and seize opportunity that you can create for yourselves. Um, I think that it's a pretty um, good assumption that there's more security work than there are qualified people to do it.
would, would most people agree with that statement? And I think that there's generally more work where people do not understand information security in a corporate environment that could really utilize the help of somebody who understands information security from a technical perspective, from a business perspective, from a marketing perspective, about how that will all tie in with their careers. And they're looking for help. They're looking to understand. People inherently want to know what they're doing. They won't, don't, nobody ever likes to feel like they're an idiot. So by taking opportunities to help educate people about what you're doing and seizing opportunities, seizing roles, seizing different um, areas where your expertise can be applied to people who don't have it, ultimately you will create more opportunity, you will create a better job, and when that promotion comes up, when that opportunity comes up, your name's going to be the one on people's tongues. Inherently, finding better opportunity, it's your responsibility on a daily basis to try to drive yourself in those directions. I got a great story about that, which, uh, you know, I, about, uh, I guess about a year ago now, um, I took a, a, uh, a particularly interesting job. And it was a fascinating opportunity, and it was an opportunity to... Uh, to work with a really cool team of people and and work for a really cool CISO doing some really really incredible work. Two weeks after I got there, CISO got fired. And they didn't replace the CISO, they basically decided to mothball the entire department. And it got particularly ugly. Um, I So if you talked to me a year ago, I wasn't I mean, I've always been interested in careers, but I wasn't the kind of, you know, I certainly hadn't studied this stuff to the point that I could get up here and speak about it. And I had the singular opportunity to work in a place where, I've, I mean, I've never seen a group of security professionals so unhappy in one place. It was, it was like you wouldn't believe. And so I called, I mean, I talked to Lee and I talked to some other friends, and basically it was, you know, it was do I go to work every day and be miserable with all these people, or do I go to work every day and figure out why these people are miserable and figure out how I can help them and figure out um, how I can never make these mistakes again, you know, and how I can never, never put other people in these places. Um, and so I spent the best part of the uh, almost 10 months that I was there doing my best to figure out what the silver lining is, doing my best to help, and doing my best to find the opportunities to learn and add value where I could, even in the worst of situations. And I think that's really the key. I mean, your job might absolutely suck. You, you may hate where you go to work every day, but I bet there's at least a few things that aren't so bad about the place. I bet there's a few things that you can find that you really like. You know, or there's some opportunities to learn some things that you would really like. You know, if you're bored at work, great time to learn about other things, right? What most of us do when we're bored at work is we end up surfing the web and reading random crap, right? That's, I mean, you know, it's fun. It's not necessarily the most constructive thing in the world. And if you have the opportunity, you can really, you can really find that silver lining. And I'm not going to be the one that stands up here and sort of, you know, rose-colored glasses says that's an easy thing to do. Um, I'll tell you, those, those 10 months, there were a lot of days when I didn't want to go to work. Um, but knowing that I could go there and, and make something out of it made it a productive experience, whereas I could have, in the other direction, just get, you know, thrown up my hands and not done anything. Well, I think that a lot of the, um, the things that you, you know, when you think about the environments that you're in, you know, trying to figure out those ways to make your days better. Um, trying to figure out ways to get more notice, to get more information, to um, to just be seen and heard a lot more so you can actually have more influence, so your job becomes more rewarding. I mean, most people when they leave jobs, they don't leave jobs because of money. They leave jobs because they believe nobody cares about what they're doing. They believe that they're unwanted. Or they believe that their advice is not listened to. So, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do you know, as far as, you know, when you're talking about your skills, you know, um, you're doing a daily, on a daily basis, you know, what you try to do is to really try to think about the skills that you have and try to how to build them. And, like, how can you go out and build your skills? You know, is it the idea of getting a different certification? Um, 
is it the idea of you know going to a different training is it building a skill that you don't necessarily have whether it's developing some communication skills whether it's picking up a new piece of technology whether it's um, learning a little bit about compliance and businessy type things or maybe it's even going back to getting a master's degree or, or, or an entry-level degree um, whatever it might be you know whenever you're making an investment in yourself you can never go wrong I mean, most people a lot of times will look at companies and say, well, my boss is not giving me any training budget. Well, whose responsibility is it to train you? Is it your company's responsibility to train you? Or is it your responsibility to train yourself? If you're not going to make investments in your own career, how could you ever expect somebody else to? So the idea is that when you say it really is up to you, it's about, it's really about not only understanding about where you want to go, but really how you're going to get there and what sacrifices that you're willing to make to attain those goals. And I think that everybody who has a job and has aspirations, it's very easy to say, I want to be the boss. It's very easy to say, I want to be a CTO or a CISO. But it's very hard to understand the sweat, the, 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 the long hours, the extra work that you do, the um, sharing with your friends, all the sacrifice, that's, that's the hard part. That's the part that nobody sees. That's the part when that happens when nobody's looking. Those are the things that you really have to think about what you're willing to do in order to achieve the things that you want to. And you know what? What's really unfair? It's unfair because you might do everything necessary, at least how you think is necessary, and you still might not be able to get there. You can push and push and push, and sometimes those doors don't open up. But there is a lot of value knowing that you have given your best effort to get there and that you've pushed on as many doors as possible to help you break through. And there's enough personal satisfaction in that alone that should be enough. But at the point is, is that as you're developing those things, as you're continuing to develop your networks of people and your personal brand and all those different things that go into helping you aspire to get to that place, if your own company doesn't notice it, somebody else will. So everything that you do that betters yourself, everything that you do that invests back in you, your money maker, your career planner, everything that that happens, you will ultimately see that benefit. It might not be today. It might be three years down the road from now. It might be 10 years down the road from now. The one constant in everybody's job is time. I, I see that. I didn't know that when I started. I didn't know that when I didn't know that when I was at I guess Black Hat Two or whatever it was. But you know, it, it, coming back here after ten years, you do realize that. You realize that as you mature, that things do continue to stay the same, and you continue to in, in your own mind that the more that you continue to build and build on a good strong foundation, the better prepared you are to take on new challenges. And when that bell rings, you're going to be considered. And I think that's the one thing that we talk to people all day long. They'll call our office up all day. We'll get the emails. I want to be a chief information security officer. OK, what do you do? Uh, I'm a systems administrator. Okay. So if I have any other jobs that will help you get there, you don't want to hear about them. No, I just want to be a chief information security officer. Of course. All my customers want to see those people. <laughs> the truth is this, is that it's a long, arduous road. But it's one where we're lucky enough that there's so much opportunity that's being created on a daily, monthly, semi-annually basis where we are fortunate. We're not accountants. 
our industry is growing, people aren't eliminating our jobs. We have three or four customers right now that are laying off three to four thousand people, but they're hiring in their information security teams. How do you think about that? Ten percent of their organizations are going to go home without paychecks. In jobs that are probably going to be very hard for them to replace at the same pay periods, but the people that we're recruiting are getting five, ten, fifteen percent increases based upon the skills that they're letting other people go, but they're hiring this skill, the skill you all possess in one degree or the other. But our clients don't call us up for garden variety people. They don't want to pay our rates for garden variety people. They call us to find specialists. They call us to find the cream of the crop. They find us the ones when they ask questions, that our people have the answers to them. And as much as what you're doing, it's about differentiating yourselves from the pack. It's about going the extra effort. It's about jumping the extra mile and doing those things. I'm going to jump in with a story, actually, because there's something on this slide. and I'm the guy, the guy I'm about to talk about is in the room, so sorry. Um, you know, there's a line on the bottom here about using your friends and peers copiously, and I think we don't do enough of that. We, we get together once or twice a year, and most of us have a couple of friends that we use. But um, a great example of using friends and peers is really seeing, you know, I, I saw somebody do it in a job search once, and it was incredible. He was looking for a job, and so was a couple of his friends. So they got together every single day and compared notes on their interviews, studied the same things, worked on the same things, and basically created like a, I'm going to find a job club. And I actually ended up hiring two of the four people in the club um, because they were so dedicated and they were such absolute, they were so insanely intense about it that they just made it happen. I mean, these were, these were guys who, I mean, who, I mean, you, you guys didn't have the resumes that anybody in this room did, but they got hired because they were so intense about it, and they came to, I mean, they came to interviews so prepared that I've never seen anything like it. But we're running, we're running short on time, so I'm going to jump through the rest of the slides a little bit more quickly. That's good. Um, so how do you know when it's time to change jobs? There's really only three reasons to change jobs, ever. There's only three good ones. The first one is your life changes. You know, for some reason, you need more money. For some reason, you have to move. Um, you know, personal happiness or um, you know, life balance. Suddenly, your boss starts asking you to work 80 hours a week and uh, never take any time off, and you never see your family anymore. Great reason to to switch. Career changes. You know, you've reached the end of the road as far as challenge in this particular job. You know, it's time to move on to the next thing. Um, you know, this isn't. This job isn't getting you to where you want to go. You know, if you know that your next job, you want to be, um, I don't know, a web application security person, and you're spending all your time reading logs, it's really not prepping you for it. The third thing is org changes. You know, um, I was just mentioning my example from my previous job where the org just completely changed out from under me. Um, I did make the best of it, but as far as going back to career, when the security team gets wiped out and you're a security person, it doesn't so much you know, lend to your career path. So in general, those are really the only three reasons we've seen. You know, a lot of times when, you know, in recruiting and things that you think about, when, when recruiting really becomes successful at the level that we deal with, is that when the employer gets something that they need and the employee gets something that they want, and that's really where that intercession kind of happens. That's where people are happy. That's where career, where people take jobs and they stay for long periods of time, which is ultimately how we're judged in my profession. So, and it's ultimately the best off for anybody here is that to be matched with a job that they're going to be able to maintain for a long time and continue to build, develop, and make the most out of. So you realize it's time for a change. You realize it's time, I'm going to go somewhere else. You know, I'm not getting what I need. I have to go somewhere else. The job search process, pretty simple. Write up a resume. You know, have it professionally written if you want. Post it on every site out there. Um, you know, apply to any job that you think is at all interesting. And um, call everybody, you know, every headhunter you can find and just say, hey, are you hiring for anything? 
and then just sit and wait. What's wrong with that? <laughs> no, I'm going to give you a list. Um, that was crap because that's what everybody does and it really doesn't work. That's about the complete backwards way to go out and look for a job. Yeah, I think everything I could have done wrong I, I put in that list. Um, because it really only works if you're lucky. And I know people who, who have gotten good jobs that way. I mean, we all do. Oh, I put my resume on Monster and some guy called me and gave me a $15,000 raise. Yeah, well, I know people who have, who have hit sevens on slot machines, too. I mean, it just doesn't work like that for most of us. The truth is that as you develop your skill, you know, one of the fortunate things about information security is that we're not a keyword business. We're just not a keyword search business. There are different degrees. I mean, you know, if I wanted to get a job to get called by every web-based recruiter out there, I could write a great resume. I know all the right things to say. And everybody would call me back. But the truth of the matter is, is that that's a lot of fluff. It becomes a lot of fluff. So, so what do you do? You got to. I mean, we've we sort of harped on this the whole time. You got to know where you want to go, and you got to know what the next step is. And once you know, once you know what, what that next step is for you, you got to start reaching out to people. It's a. It's back to branding and networking. You've got to get to know people. You've got to get all of those people that you know and say, all right, this is what I want to do. Um, do you know anybody who's doing that? Do you know anybody who you think's doing that? And start to get connected to people. The truth is this, is that when you wind up looking for something for yourself, you should be having this circle of people, whether they're made up of peers that work at other companies, whether they're made up of bosses and former bosses, maybe a mentor, maybe a professor. I will go out on the limb and say, if I was going to be, if I was going to, if I was a chef, I would find the best chef recruiter I had possible. If I was the best real estate attorney, I would find a real estate attorney. I wouldn't find a general, I wouldn't find an IT recruiter if I was a chef. Just like if I was in information security, I wouldn't be trusting myself to a generalist. It doesn't make any sense. You guys pour so much work into everything that you do. Why would you trust your career? to somebody who only does that a part of their time. And that's the problem with internal recruitment functions in corporations because they're so tasked doing so many different things, they can't possibly understand what's important to you, information security professional. So we're sort of getting the, uh, we're, we're about to get the hook here, but I, I wanted to wrap up and, and say, that, I mean, we, there's a lot that we haven't talked about. I, Lee and I could have talked for three or four hours on this and, and probably not run out of topics because there's so many different pieces to, to managing your own career. Um, we're going to, we're going to go to the Q&A room as soon as this is over. Um, if you have questions, we'd love to answer them. Before, before we go out, I actually wrote a, uh, a book. At, when I was working at that company, I got so frustrated with uh, the way things were going for people, I ended up writing a book. And um, I set up an email address. Anyone here who wants a copy of the ebook, just fire off an email to defcon at forgettheparachute.com. It'll send you a copy of the ebook. Um, I, I just thought it would be cool to give that to everybody in the industry. It was written because I was so frustrated watching, you know, information security people be frustrated in their jobs. So I figure uh, you might get some use out of it. Hopefully you enjoy it. Um, our email addresses are up there. I mean, feel free to email me with any questions you have. I'm, I will do my best to answer. I'm sure Lee wouldn't mind being emailed anytime also. Definitely. Thank you all very much for coming. Yeah. And um, Seriously, thank you. you. This has been fun. Thank you.